Father God, we thank you so much that you've given us the opportunity to gather around your word. And may it be now your word that speaks. May it be now your word that moves. May it be now your word that changes lives. May we now get serious about receiving and hearing and believing and changing by the power of your spirit through the wonders of your word. Please, God, I pray for some in here that they never knew what their gifts were, what their calling is. May today be your word that shows them. We love you, Lord, and we're ready to receive your word. In your name, Lord Jesus, amen. amen. Look at the size of that kid, guys. Just turn around and look at that kid. If you weren't here about six weeks ago, we dedicated him. Turn around. Let's let everybody see that kid. Look at this kid. Turn around. Let us see him. He was this big when he was born. Uh, chapter 9, the book of Acts, 32nd verse. Now it came to pass, as Peter went through all the parts of the country, that he also came down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda. There he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he rose immediately. So all who dwelt in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Please give me your attention. Did I leave those papers back there, Austin? Did I? Yeah, I did. I wrote down these verses to go with... Uh, the Bible study. Thank you very much. The apostles now, after Saul's conversion, and now he becomes the apostle Paul we're going to see in the next few chapters, there was a time of um, peace, a time of success, a time of where see, things started to come together in the church. And one of the ways they did was by people seeing miracles that were happening and believing because of those miracles. Now, what has happened, application for ourselves in the church, is this. We, who have become so conditioned to be afraid of, or should I say cautious with, the name it and claim it movements, the word of faith movements, we forget that there is still power in believing. In walking in the promises of God. We sometimes find ourselves so, oh, we don't do that. We don't, endure. We don't speak in tongues in the church. We don't believe that if you do that, if we do that. You must remember still even now. The God who did these miracles through the apostles then, still the same God. And the miracles are very much for today, just like they were then. I do not believe for one second that they had some power available to them that's not available to us. We're going to look at some of the things that he's done. Here, a man was healed. Now, here's a question I want you guys to ask. Is everybody who get prayed over that sick get healed? Of course not. It didn't happen in the Bible times and it doesn't happen now. So the question then begs, well, if it doesn't always happen, then why pray? Well, for two reasons. Number one, and this is probably the lesser of the importance, is you never know when God's going to do a miracle and use your life for a faith example. But number two, and this is the most important, is praying with belief doesn't necessarily change your circumstance, but it changes the condition of your heart. Now, how do you want to walk around? Do you want to walk around bummed? Well, things didn't work out for me, you know. I have a, a life of misery. Things aren't. You know, some of the people, and I use this guy as an example because to me it's, it's the, the greatest example of what I've, I've heard. You talk about a guy, we, we've been studying Job, you, you look at Job and you say, oh my goodness, if I went through that, I don't know if I'd still believe in God. You could come on a Wednesday night and see what Job's gone through. But there's a man named John Corson. Some of you guys have looked up, you, 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 you told me you did, right? You hear his testimony, how in his mid-twenties, 
His wife was killed. They were in the car together driving, hit a patch of ice, she gets killed. Then some 10 years later, after he remarried, his oldest daughter that he had with that wife, she's about 19 years old at the time, she leaves a morning prayer meeting, driving along the same road, hits a patch of ice, she dies. You hear all the things that happened to him. He tells this amazingly funny story. But after his wife died, he had to learn how to make food. He never was, you know, big on food, so he ate a lot of peanut butter. <laughs> and one day he said he got home from church. It was 9, 10 o'clock at night. He makes himself a peanut butter sandwich, and he's just talking about how miserable he is and why did this turn around in my life? Why does this got to happen to me? He's got to take care of these. He's got three kids, and oh, my goodness. And he's making a peanut butter sandwich. He starts eating a peanut butter sandwich. And it gets stuck in his throat. He said, he said, a good 15, 20 seconds. He can't breathe. He's trying to get this thing out. He's pouring the milk in his mouth. The milk's running down. Said, Finally, he gets it down. He said, but during this time, which seemed like an hour, he had all this time to think. And hearing him tell the story is so much better. He says, my kids are going to find me dead with peanut butter and milk stuck in my beard. <laughs> and what have I done with my life except live in my misery instead of the freedom that God has given me? Death is not the end, it's the beginning for a Christian. Death doesn't hold sway over us anymore. So during this time of thinking he was going to die from choking on a peanut butter sandwich, it was the end of him. He's no longer going to be miserable. And when you see John Corson, if you don't, and I suggest that you look him up online, go, go to YouTube and look up John Corson testimony and hear the story for yourself, because believe me, I don't do it any justice. He is a, he's a football player in, in high school and a little in college, and he's got these big giant hands, and when he talks, he goes, you know, God's plan, it's way cool. He's just a, a funny, smiley. If you, if you listen to this guy preach without knowing his testimony, you'd think, Man, that's Santa Claus over there. He's just a happy, you know, what the world calls a happy-go-lucky guy. And it's because he believes that by praying for something, you're not just changing the circumstance, because your circumstance might not change. We're going to look at the next part of this story, and we're going to see, you can look and say, well, if God healed Aeneas, if God healed this guy, why didn't God heal my father? Why didn't God heal your son? Why didn't God rescue your daughter? You can live like that. You could ask God why. You could, you could wonder why God chose to afflict you. Or you could allow the power of God's love to transform you and say, well, if God wants me to go through this, then obviously he wants me to talk to somebody who's going through the same thing. And if God chose me, then he must have an amazing plan. What a difference. What a different attitude. What a difference. This is where believing changes everything. I want to read you some things that the Lord Jesus, this is just the Lord Jesus, said in his word about believing. In Matthew 9, 28, he said, And when he had come into the house, the blind man came to him. And Jesus said to him, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Do you believe? Do you believe that he's able to heal you? Because whether you believe or not is very possible, not only whether you receive the healing or how you live if you don't receive your healing. If you believe that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, if you believe that he is the escape from death, if you believe that he is, was, and who is to come, if you believe he is almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipresent, if you believe that, your fear will subside. Your anxieties will lessen. And nothing will stop you. Nothing. We had this fighter in the gym. Um, his name was Robbie Lawler. Robbie Lawler started MMA at a very young age. He was one of these guys um, before the 
um, the rise of, of MMA, he was just a heart, ugh, just a monster of a fighter. Well, as MMA developed, it kind of developed without him, and he lost a bunch of fights. He got submitted by good jiu-jitsu guys. He got knocked out by a better striker. And his career was basically over. I mean, everybody knew he was a, a has-been. And when I met him, believer, strong in the Lord, when he found out I was a pastor, he, he broke, pray with me. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd lay hands and pray, and he'd lift his hands up like this. And all of a sudden, he got a call to fight in the UFC. And he won a fight, and then he won another fight, and then he won another fight. And then all of a sudden, he's the champion. And he won a few fights as the champion. Some of his fights are the greatest fights that you've ever seen, you that are into such things as, as MMA fighting. And um, I like to use him as an example because if when he lost a few fights, oh. Shucks. Um, he didn't. He had the balance between doing what he's supposed to do and letting God do what he's supposed to do. So many of us, whether it's in business or in sports, our failures define us. Not our belief that God could take our failures and turn them around. Not our belief that it doesn't matter whether I lost five fights in a row, I believe that God's plan for me, according to Scripture, is to give me a future and a hope. I believe that God's plan says to me that all things are working in my life together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. Do you guys hear what I'm saying? I so want this message to penetrate your heart here because so many of us, we get frozen in fear. What makes one person successful and another one not? We have a saying in jiu-jitsu. You know what a black belt is? It's a white belt that never quit. Wow. You can let fear run your life. Or, again, verse 12 of John chapter 3, the Lord Jesus said, If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how you believe if I tell you heavenly things? He's saying, I'm telling you that I rule over earth and heaven. Why fear you? Why do you fear about health and money? And why? Don't you understand? I've got it all. Why are some men rich? Why are they lucky? Why do they have this privilege? Why does this faith to believe? This opportunity for success, whether it's success driving a big car or living in a little house. The success is not external, it's internal. And I'll tell you how I know that. If you've ever gone on a mission trip, short term or long term, if you've ever been in a third world country, I went to, uh, as a matter of fact, me and Kevin went with his brother to, to Rio de Janeiro. And while I was in Rio, by the way, I drank more acai than humans are supposed to drink. Not good. It was good though, wasn't it? A friend of mine I saw while I was there that I know from here, oh, Ryan, I did not know you were in Rio. Come on, you come with me. I was like, oh man, I gotta, we got a training. No, one hour. Now listen to me. I am not a prejudiced man. But if a Brazilian tells you one hour, do not believe him. He might not be lying, but he certainly ain't telling the truth. <laughs> so he, we get in a cab, we drive about 45 minutes, and the cab stops. And, and my friend, he looks at me and goes, okay, we get out now. Oh, is this where the gym is? We were going to this very famous boxing gym in Rio. There's a guy named Claudio Coelho. So we're going to him. So we get out of the cab. It's me. Um, Rafael Suncio and um, Jucao, his name is, Hoan Canero. We get out of the car and we start to walk and I go, where's Jim? He goes, oh, it's about a mile that way. He goes, well, why? Why did we get out here? He goes, well, they won't go there. I said, why that? He goes, that's the favela. 
I said, what's a favela? He goes, in English it's called ghetto. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a little different here. So we're walking up this hill and you see mounds of garbage. You see tin shack, literally walls made of, of pieces of wood that are rotting with just metal over the top of them. Their lights, some of their lights, I mean, I'm telling you, they look like somebody hooked them into the, the, the pole and it was like a string hanging down with a light on it. And I'm walking, I'm like, man, he is, these people is dirt poor. And I thought I knew what, like, I need to stop complaining, you know what I mean? But let me tell you what I saw. I saw kids running around, having fun with old bicycle tires. I saw them throwing rocks and sticks and, and you know, they didn't know how unhappy they were supposed to be by not having what they thought they needed. And it's not like they didn't have a TV. And this crazy thing though, it's so funny. You had some of these tin shacks that yet yeah, there was a Cadillac parked out a couple of them. You know, it's like, they got a Cadillac, but they don't, they don't have a house. And every one of them had a smartphone and Facebook, that's for sure. And we go up in this building and we train and we work out. And then when we go outside the other side of the building, there's two armed guards on the other side of the building. And I said, I said, Yuka, what's this? He goes, that side's favela. This is the richest part of Rio. You go in one side of the building, you go up and you train. And then if you go out though, you have to be, they will let you out because you can't go in the other side. But one side is like one of the wealthiest areas and the other side, It is not the substance that you possess that will dictate your happiness or lack thereof. Whether you've had it and lost it or lost it and had it or... It's all about believing. Faith will chase fear. Do you guys hear what I'm saying here? Am I making this clear? So important to not just say, oh, I know this message. Oh, yeah, I heard this. Some of us here are racked in fear. And when I say racked, I mean you're on a board, your hands are tied, and you're being stretched to the end because you got a phone call that your mortgage was late, or the rent's due and the landlord threatened to throw you out, or your water might get turned off, or listen, so what? God is able to make all grace abound. You're going to die. Eventually, you're going to die. The walk of shame for Tony and Angela now. Here it comes. Oh, he's going to send her. Your child. I told you that, your kid. Look at what your kid's doing now. I'm so bad. My wife's mad at me now. <sighs> we can't. You can't. Do you love God? Then let God do it. But you don't understand. I go to bed and I, I, I wake up. You're right, I don't understand, but God understands. Allow the faith in God to erase the fear of lack of God. Listen, I ain't even started yet. Listen to this. But if you do not believe his writings, how you believe my words? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If you're having a faith problem, where do you find faith, guys? The word of God. If you're weak in faith, read the Bible. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. And how many of these things are so true? How many of you guys have seen God work in your life over and over? How many of you guys have been in this same exact position you're in? Man, I'm telling you, I looked up online. If you have a cough and an earache at the same time, you've got this disease and you're going to die. Are you, got, are you one of those? 
And yet God showed up. Oh, I'm telling you that this happened. I'm tell- and here you're absolutely, positively sure you're going to die. You're going to go broke. You're going to get arrested. You're going to get divorced. Your husband's cheating. I mean, here's all the list of things. And yet God showed up. None of those things happened. But the next time it's like all over again. I'm telling you, last time God showed up, but this time he must be busy or something like that. He must be on vacation because... But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins if you do not believe that I am He. You will die in your sins. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. That's a scary one. You know why they didn't, you know why the Pharisees wouldn't turn? You know why those who, who, who were stuck in their religion refused to give their heart? Because he told them the truth. You ever tell somebody the truth? You one of those people? Oh, you're going to hear it now. I'm going to keep it real. It's funny how when you do that, nobody listens to you after that. Everything you say after that, they just, they don't listen. So funny, if you tell somebody the truth in love and mercy, they might actually hear you. Like he did, not like I do. And I tell you the truth, so why do you not believe me? Jesus heard that they had cast him out, speaking of the man who he healed, and he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. That's a hard one. But if I do, though you do not believe in me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Believe, 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 believe. 30 some odd times just in the gospel. Believe, believe, believe. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The works that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. And John 16, he said, do you now believe? What a question. Do you now believe? Do you believe? Why are the people in Rio de Janeiro, in the, in the favela, having the joy of the Lord, living in a tin shack, and we, who our biggest worry is, I crunch, when, when, those, new, those new potato chips I bought, I can't hear the TV when I'm eating them because it crunches in my ear. I hate that. I, I didn't have any AAA batteries, and the, and the TV box is broken, and... I don't have triple A's. I don't want to go to the store now. Back to Acts 9. At Joppa, is that where I left off? There was a certain disciple named Tabitha, or Tabitha, however you want to pronounce it, which is translated Dorcas. No wonder they called it Tabitha. Although, if you want to know the truth, Dorcas believes gazelle graceful and beautiful. So, Dorcas? No. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lida was near Joppa... And the disciples had heard that Peter was there. They sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Now, just so you guys know, Lida and Joppa were about eight miles away. Now, what if somebody came to you and said, hey, can you come walk to my town? What if somebody in West Palm said, hey, can you just come here and pray over me? Well, where are you at? Well, I'm in, um, I'm in, um, uh, let's think of one. Off of Linton. It's about eight miles away. Yeah, I'm, I'll just, I'll, no problem, I'm on my way. Then Peter arose and went with them. 
when he had come, they um, brought him to the upper room, and all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, or Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And when he gave her his hand and lifted her up, and when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive and became known throughout all Joppa. And many believed on the Lord. So it was he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon the Tanner. Okay, I, I glossed over that quickly, but this is called raising somebody from the dead. This is what they call the gift of miracles. It's like, wow, that just happened. But there's an interesting thing here that happened. Does anybody remember a little girl that died, that the Lord said, I'm sorry, um, Jairus, or Jairus, however you want to pronounce it. He had a little daughter, and they said, Can you, he said, please come and heal my daughter. And then she died while he was on the way, and they said, hey, listen, don't bother to teach her anymore, she's dead. And Jairus, like, flips out, and he grabs him and says, listen, relax, I got this. Now, of course, I'm paraphrasing, he really didn't say that. But he gets there, and the first thing he does is he puts everybody out, and he says to her, if you remember... The words, anybody remember the words? Talitha kumai, which in um, Aramaic means little girl arise. Now, I find it interesting that Peter did the exact same thing. First, he puts everybody out. And then how weird is it that her name, Tabitha or Tabitha, is so close to Talitha. Now, what does that mean? I have no idea what the correlation is. But I just found it more than a little interesting how there is a, a very similar... Maybe when you don't know what to do, you just refer to the manual and do what he told you to do. And do what he did. Maybe just the application of his life into our lives, maybe that's just enough. You guys understand what I'm saying or not? The latter part, I would like to go to chapter 10, but 10 we have to cover the whole thing, and it's a long chapter, and it's a really, really important chapter. So what I want to do is spend the last 5 or 10 minutes talking about something that we see here in Scripture. Now, does anybody know what happened when, when, when Peter healed Aeneas, or Aeneas, again, these names are open to uh, interpretation in, when it comes to the pronunciation of them. That's called the gift of healings. Raising the dead is called the gift of miracles. We talked about faith and how walking out faith changing, but let me ask some of you guys a question. Does anybody here wonder what their gifts are? You wonder what your gifts are. So many people in the church, they hear, the Bible says earnestly desire spiritual gifts. The gifts of, of the Spirit are evident. It talks all about what are the gifts. Obviously, as a pastor, somebody walking with the Lord for almost 25 years, you got to say, well, Ryan, you know what your gifts are, right? Well, I know what they are for the last season of my life. I know right now he's given me the gift of teaching because I'm teaching you guys, and some of you guys actually are listening. Now, if you knew my life and where I came from, believe me when I tell you, you'd be like, eh, I don't know if I want to learn the Bible from that guy. But it's a gift given. And you can look at other people... If he, you know what gift I hate? Um, and it's in the scripture as well, but we're not going to talk about it today. The gift of woodworking. Have you ever seen a woodworker, craftsman, somebody who can take a piece of wood and car You ever see the tables they make out of trees? I can't, I can't drive by when they, when in my neighborhood, they cut down the trees and they got these giant trees laying around. They cut them up. I can't drive by one without looking at it. Like, man, that would make a great table. I wish I knew how to do that. But you see somebody here and... And, and I, I make my own cages for my, for my animals, and nothing ever works out. It's, it's like the, the edges always hang. It's like, man, people that do the crown molding, and they miter the corners, like, oh, man, how do they do that? I hate those people. So jealous. Well, maybe you're here and you're wondering, man, I hate that guy. How does he? I'll tell you how I did this by seeking the Lord in prayer, 
by begging God to reveal to me not just the gifts that he has already in me, but revealing to me the gifts that he wants me to have. Now you say, well, does that mean that everybody has gifts? Everybody has gifts, even the three stoogers over there. Oh, no. Mo, Larry, and Curly. <laughs> they all have gifts, Aww. spiritual gifts. Now watch this. Christian, you have the gift of encouragement. You know how I know that? Because when I talk to you, I want to hear what you got to say. When you are passionate about something, like when we talk about fishing with you, it's like, man, take me fishing. That's the gift of encouragement. You have to sharpen it. You have to pray it out. You have to bring it out. And you have to ask God to let you use it for his, his ministry. But the thing is, all people have gifts and most of them never use them, for this, never use them for the good of the body. All people have gifts. Some of them, people in the world, they have gifts that they have not yet God convert. Like me, in the world, you guys that have been in this church, you know. In the, in the world, you know what my gift was? Paranoia. I, I'm not joking. I was really, really paranoid in the world. I didn't know... When God saved me, he took the gift of paranoia and he made it the gift of discernment. I could actually read people. Not I mean read their mind, don't get me wrong. I can look at them, look in the eye. Like sometimes, especially when I'm fasting, I can look in a person's eyes and see, wow, this person has a broken heart. It's the craziest thing. My wife goes, how do you do that? I don't know. I just, we could be at a restaurant and I look at the person and I go, Man, that girl's hurting, honey. Pray for her. Like, how do you, and when she'll pray for her and she'll start crying. Oh, I'm going through this thing. She'll, how do you do that? I don't know. It's a gift. So you don't look at me because I didn't give myself the gift. I can go through each one of you guys and tell you gifts because I know you three intimately. And each one of you guys, you don't just have gifts. You have gifts. You have real gifts. And if you would let God use them, if you would let God hone them, you would damage the kingdom of hell in ways you never imagined. Now, let's quickly look at the gifts. Let's see if we can get anybody to, boom, to, to be touched by these gifts. Turn to 1 Corinthians, a few pages to the right, two or three books to the right, chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Watch this. It's a short chapter. I'm going to read it to you, and I'm going to talk a little bit about not just... Now watch. Now this is very interesting. The gifts of the Spirit do not only come with a gift, but they come with this personality. And as I say this, identify yourself and identify others. Watch. You're going to love this. It's really cool. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away with these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So I can spend two weeks there teaching from there, but let's just say he wants you to know that unless you have the Spirit of the living God in you, it's going to be really hard for you to identify the gifts that God has for you. Do you understand that? You can't just go to church on Sunday, maybe even go to church on Wednesday, and, and think that you're going to experience the fullness of the spiritual gift. You've got to pray it out. You've got to search it out. You've got to come to tonight's study and, and be baptized in the Holy Spirit and say, that's my gifts. If you don't go to the gym and train, I'm sorry, you're not going to get good at whatever sport it is you're looking for. Spiritual things work the same way. We've talked about this. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are diversities of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one. Now you could circle that each one. That means everybody for the profit of all. So here's what happens, guys, and he's going to expound on it. 
in this church body, you come here and you say, you know what, man, I dig that church. It's a nice family church. People love on each other. I'm going to make that church my home church. And now immediately God dispatches an angel and says, listen, let's go look at that church. Let's see what that church needs. That church needs a prophet. That church needs an administrator. That church needs, and now oh, there you are. God, I wish I was administrator. I wish I was, had the gift of help. Boom. God says that church needs it. Here it is, and he pours it out upon you. Because the church that you're attending, the church that you're a part of needs it. Some people never experience their spiritual gifts. And one of the reasons, amongst the other things that I said, are they don't need, you don't need the spiritual gifts. What are you going to need them for? Now, the gift of miracles that we saw the raising from the dead, let me tell you something what happened today. If God poured that gift out like he did back then, you know what would happen? You'd have a guy on TV. He'd be, he'd be the man who raised from the dead. I mean, listen, you could look in Scripture. Uh, in Scripture. Uh, you can look on, um, on YouTube, and, and I think Benny Hinn one time claimed to have raised somebody from the dead. It's like, serious? And what did you do with that gift? What did you do with that talent? What did you do with that miracle? You told people if they sent you $12.99 for the tape series, you could, and a million people bought it. And so you live in a, uh, you have five houses, and come on. So why wouldn't God pour the gift of miracles out right now? I'll tell you why. Because we'd abuse it. I know for me, you guys ever see that miracle that, uh, that Moses did? There's a story in the book of, uh, in, in the book of um, Genesis where Moses had this trick that he would do. He'd open his shirt and he'd put his hand in and he'd take it out and it'd be leprous. He'd put it back in, he'd take it out and be clean again. If I had that gift, are you kidding me? No wonder he doesn't give me that gift. I'd totally abuse I'd be at the gym or something like that. Ah! 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 It'd be over. It'd be, I'd, be, I'd abuse it in a second. In a second, I'd abuse it. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. The first gift we look at is the word of wisdom. The gift of the Spirit, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, is the word of wisdom. And let me explain to you what that is. You're talking with somebody, and all of a sudden God says to your heart somehow, that dude needs to know the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And you say to him, you know, I think I got a verse for you from the Lord. Well, and he says to you, speak on. The Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And he looks and you goes, dude, I just read that this morning. Well, there you go, it's the Lord. Well, what's, what, what am I doing wrong here? And then you start to expound to him, sister or brother. You say, you know, all the great things you got going on in your life right now, you're missing the one thing. And that's that real relationship with the Lord. If things are tough out in the world, that's because every time... You, things are going good for you, you forget about God. And every time things are going bad for you, you remember who God is. And they receive it and they go, man, I needed to hear that. And you walk away and you go, I don't know how I did that. That's the gift of the word of wisdom. Some people have this as a gift where they can do that often. Usually those people are extremely studious. Usually the person with the gift of, of uh, wis a word of wisdom if you remember, if any of you guys went to Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale back in the day, there was a guy named Jeff Buck. Jeff Buck, man, this dude had the gift of a word of wisdom. He wasn't just given a word of wisdom for somebody, which can happen to anybody, but he would always have a word of wisdom. Now, more often than not, the person that has the gift of the word of wisdom, he's in the Proverbs every single day. He reads and he has relationships. He's a relationship-building person. He's not a, 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 an introvert. He's an extrovert. He's, he's engaged in people's life without judgment. She cares about people. Continuing. To another, a word of knowledge through the same spirit. A word of knowledge. That gift, the word of knowledge is when God tells you something about somebody that they didn't know you know. Now, quite often I'll be preaching and somebody will walk up to me and go, my wife called you before the service, didn't she? And I go, come on, 
Really? No. There's no way you could have known the things. Because when you were preaching, you were preaching right at me. Well, Diana called me up. She told me all this stuff going on in Kevin's life, and that's why I'm preaching this stuff now. No. Didn't know anything. God gave me a word of knowledge through Scripture that I'm now pouring out upon you. You're sitting here. Your heart is burning right now. Why is he talking about me? Why? You told him. Now, you can do the same thing. God will give you a word of knowledge. But let me tell you what happens with the word of knowledge. Word of knowledge must be followed by James 3.17. The, the, when God gives you something to give somebody else, you must do it with love and grace, a heart willing to yield, a heart willing to help. Now, some people are thinking prophetic word. That is not a prophetic word. The word of knowledge is usually the gift that comes with a lot of fasting where you could sense the hurt in somebody's spirit and your heart hurts with their hurt. You could sense the joy in their spirit and your heart rejoices when they rejoice. That is also a person who builds relationships. A person who will engage in life. Let me tell you, the person who has the word of knowledge, the personality, the way it comes out, that's the person that would help you move if you asked them to, and not too many people would. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to help anybody move. Moving stinks. There's only one thing worse than unloading a truck. Loading the truck. <laughs> Continuing. Faith to another faith. That is a gift of the Spirit. That is a gift of the Spirit. Usually, this is more of, of the person who so trusts in God. Some people in the world call it ignorance. I don't care. God will take care of it. Usually, that person says this really ridiculous phrase. Hey, it is what it is. It is what it is. You know, they're going to come and shut down your... It is what it is. Hey, you know, they're going to... It is what it is. You know, the doctor said, faith. Some people have the gift of faith. Usually that person who has the gift of faith is usually the largest tithers. The people who so believe what God's word says because the, the person that can give, that's the person who goes, hey, listen, if I give this, I won't have this. But I believe so much that God's faithful. Here, God, this is yours. That faith gift, that's a big one. By the same Spirit, to another, gifts of healings. Some people have the gift of healings. Where Now, not the gift of healing, but the gift of healings. Where that person, that am I losing some of you guys? Stay focused. I want you guys, come on, take a second. Shake it out. Come back to me. I know I've covered a lot already, and we've got a little ways to go. How, how long have I been going? Huh? 33? Oh, goodness, 43, yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to go a lot longer. Okay, I'm going to run through these. Gift of healings. That's somebody who has the gift to pray for people and have them be healed. Now, usually this person, though, we used to have this ministry where the hospital would let us go in and we would go room to room praying for people. Now, how many of you guys think that would be, like, really cool to do? You want to go to the hospital? You think that would be cool to do? Let me tell you, I used to go to the, the, the children's wing and pray for people in the children's wing. It, it, um, what's the name of the hospital? Uh, Joe DiMaggio. In, in, and you go to the kids that have cancer, and you go from room to room. And Yeah, I wasn't cut out for that. No, I, didn't, I, didn't, uh, I couldn't go home without weeping for days. But there's some people, and I've met them, and they have the gift of healings. They just go from room to room. You don't know what God's doing. You know, and God doesn't heal everybody. He never does. But sometimes you see people like cancer-free, rose up from the bed. You're like, wow. Guys, everybody wants the gift. Everybody wants a gift where they go, uh-huh, here he is. Here's the prophet. Here he is. I've got it. But the, the, what, what, what makes the gift happen is the grinding of prayer. It's the, it's the time in the word. It's the going to the hospital and going room to room, door to door. 
It's the getting up early on a Saturday and going and seeing these poor people in, in the convalescent home. And no, I'm, I'm not going to be there, guys. I'm not. I got to study on Saturday mornings to, to do this for you. I'm not going to be there. So you who go to the convalescent home, yes, that's the gift of helps, the gift of compassion, the gift of mercy. Continuing. Working of miracles we talked about to another prophecy. The gift of prophecy is not somebody who can foretell the future. The gift of prophecy is somebody who gives the word of God and it applies to your life for the future. You say, listen, you come to a, you come to a, um, a young parent and you say, you know, the Bible says that a child left to himself will cause shame and bring reproach. What are you trying to say? Listen, I'm trying to say that... Um, if you don't start beating that child once in a while, he's going to bring you a lot of pain in the future. How dare you? Now, everybody wants the gift of prophecy when it gives them, that guy's a prophet. You go to some churches, real ultra-Pentecostal churches, and they're like, oh, hey, that's Prophet Johnson. Yeah, Prophet Johnson, he's, uh, he's the prophet in here. But the real gift of prophecy comes with the reward of the gift of prophecy. Anybody want the prophet's reward? You know what the prophet's reward is? Let's talk about the prophet's reward. Let's see, who's the best prophet ever? I guess that would be Isaiah, right? Oh, he got cut in half. Yeah, they didn't give him a chair at the front of the table. You know, you go to some churches, they got the, the chairs in the back, and, and that's, that's Apostle Joe, and that's Prophet Johnson, and that's, you know, Prophetess Billy Joe, or, you know, and that's how that works. But in, real, in the real world, in, in, in the Christian world, Jeremiah was an amazing prophet. 50 years of ministry. And he didn't see one convert. Not one. That's a gift. Continuing. Discerning of spirits. <laughs> Have you ever met somebody and all of a sudden you're like, wow, I really hate that person. They, what did, they didn't do nothing to you. Nah, there's something about that person. I just hate them. Dude, what are you, what are you talking about, man? We just, we just had one conversation. There's something about them I don't like. As a matter of fact, I want to smash them. Dude, that's, a, that's rough. Usually, that's the person that doesn't even know it. They have the, the gift of discernment of spirits. There's something about that person that's either ungodly, unholy. It might even be satanic. And you don't know what it is, but you're just around and you're like, yeah! Now, listen, that gift can be misconstrued because sometimes personalities clash. And that's just the way it is. But when you're praying in a circle, and whether you're in Rio de Janeiro, South Florida, or any place in between and around. The Spirit moves upon you when you're praying, and you sense the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the sweetest thing in the world. It's called fellowship. Boogie, you have the gift of fellowship, bro. Just hanging out with you is so much fun. It is. I don't even know what it is. I hardly even know you, man, but I know you. I love you. Just hanging out with you is good. I just want to be around you, bro. You have the gift of fellowship. It's a beautiful gift. Some people have that. Matt's got that gift, too. I know what it's about, you big bear of men. I love you. <laughs> Honey, I'm not going there. You have every gift. I love your gifts. They're beautiful. You have the gift of beauty. Matter of fact, look at those three prophetesses back there. Different kinds of tongues. Now, these are what's called the sign gifts. We're moving over to the sign gifts. The gift of speaking in tongues. If you've never heard anybody speak in tongues, come out tonight, maybe somebody will speak in tongues, I don't know. But it kind of doesn't have anything that you would think it has. Sometimes it sounds like stammering of lips according to scripture, but sometimes it's just a song. Sometimes it's what's called other tongues where you speak in a different language and didn't even know you could speak that language. Sometimes it's an uttering, muttering of an umbrella upon somebody. 
According to 1 Corinthians 15, you could read that later, it speaks of the different kinds of speaking in tongues. Some people speak in tongues to rejoice, and they speak in tongues in worship. Some people speak in tongues to cast demons out. Some people speak in tongues for a prophetic word. There's so many different kinds of tongues, or what the Bible calls other tongues. Those are signed gifts. There are gifts that bring attention to the person. And again, reading scripture, you could see some gifts were meant to edify the body, some meant to edify the church, some meant to edify the people. Each, each gift has a different reason. I'm going to breeze through these. I know we're going. Um, read the rest of that for, for homework. I'm going really much longer than I planned on going. Turn, if you would please, to Romans, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 12. All the way to the right, about eight, about eight books. Hebrews chapter 12, the last of these gifts. Did I mess up? Stay with me. It was dark when I was writing this down. Romans chapter 12. Okay. Who said that, Johnny? Huh? Who said that? The Lord. You said that? My man. Romans chapter 12. How did I write down Hebrews? Doesn't matter. Romans chapter 12. All the way back to the left. All the way down to verse 6 of Romans chapter 12. Everybody there say amen, please. All the way on the other side of the Bible. New Testament, all the way in the back. So you're better off going to the book of Revelation and turning back a few pages. Everybody? Everybody's there? Okay. Chapter 12, a book of Romans, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Let us use them. Now, the original language in, 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 the, in the Greek, that is what's called a double imperative. It means when he says, let us use them, he's saying, use it. Do it. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith, some gifts work together. Or ministry, let us use it in ministering. You know, does anybody know what the word ministry means in the original language? Serve. When you're a minister, that makes you a servant. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts. The gift of exhortation is an amazing gift. You know how you can tell a person who has a gift of exhortation? They're the one that comes to you and goes, dude, I heard the greatest song. you got to listen to it. And you go, okay, I'll listen to it later. No, you got to listen to it now. I don't want to listen to it now. I'm busy. No, no, listen to this, please, now. It's the person who wants to watch a movie with you that they've already saw. Just so they could see your reaction while you watch it with them. That's the person that has the gift of exhortation. And, and like... To them, watching the movie alone, eh, I want to watch it with you. I want to see what you do when we're watching. Look at this scene. What? It's the person who has their hand on the remote control. It pauses all the time. you got to see this part. Margus, this is the coolest part. Hold on, let me rewind it a little bit. Oh, crap. I started it over. Let's just watch it from the beginning. You guys know what I'm talking about? This is the person that that can take the word of God and say, listen, listen to me. The Bible says, you shall be made whole. Walk in that. You're going to be made whole. I am, I am, I am, I am. They take what's in their heart and they give you a little bit of it. He who gives with liberality. He who gives with liberality. Let me tell you something. I served at my old church for almost 14 months in, in, in benevolent ministry. In a benevolent ministry. That's the ministry. My old church had like a mega budget. 
and they would give away over $150,000 to $300,000 a year to people who would just show up to the church. In 14 months in that ministry, every single day, half a dozen people come, oh, I need money for my rent, I need money for my mortgage, I need money for food. All the time in the church, bam, giving it out. In those 14 months, you know how many people I met that tithed faithfully, that had money problems? One. One. And you know what that person did? He gave the money back to the church after he got his job back. People that have that gift of giving, seldom do they worry about money. And usually, they're the ones that have more of the money than you ever imagined. They ain't lucky. They're faithful. God bless you. He who leads with diligence. Yes, leadership is a gift. Do you notice how some people just follow other people? That's a gift. Ah, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Ah, okay, I've, I've gone long. I'm much, I, I didn't want to go so long because we got... Uh, guys, hand out the communion. I'll finish while we hand out the communion. Guys, so here's the thing. I'll do another Bible study that gives the Spirit in the coming months because it's going to come up a few times in the book of Acts and we can go through those in a little bit greater detail. We're going to do communion. It's, we're going to be about another five or six minutes. Um, where's he at? Maddie. Yep. Oh, you got a song, please? Yep. So if this is your time and you're wondering, and, and I really hit you here with some of these things, the gifts of the Spirit, man, I really want the gifts of the Spirit. I really want to know what my gift is. Listen to the things. Again, Romans chapter 12, verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Look these up. Pray them through. What's your gift? Because one thing is for certain. You all got them. And I wasn't trying to be Southern there. You all got them. Thank you, bro. Everybody here has gifts. Oh, not me. I don't have any. You have gifts. Spiritual gifts. You've got to apply yourself to use them. Now maybe today, in communion, God will open the doors to the vision of what it is to have your spiritual gift. Maybe today, during communion... Where are you going, Rob? Oh. <laughs> TMI. So here's what we want. When you get that communion elements, hold them in your hands. Spend a minute in prayer and ask God, God, what are my gifts? And remember a few things, okay? Remember a few things before you hit this. Number one, you're never going to get your spiritual gifts to the fullest place without getting serious about your relationship with the Lord. You're certainly never going to get your gifts to the place where you want them to be without your dedication to a church. God wants to use you. But it's like, did anybody ever see the, uh, what's that movie called with the uh, mutants, Bubba? The X-Men movies. And some of these mutants, they were like, what, what do they call them, like six tier? What are they called? Omega level. Omega level? What was the other ones, though? What was that girl that had the thing going on in her face? Huh? But what, what, what was her? She's like a level five or something like that? Is that what it's called? Phoenix? <laughs> Nobody's going to sit at home and be an omega level mutant when it comes to spiritual gifts. You've got to get out and use them. You've got to get out and use them. The only reason Jean Grey had all those gifts, she was using them, man. That's it. See what I did there? And isn't it so frustrating when you meet somebody who has that Omega level gift? Man, they can do anything. Mickey can do anything. And when I say anything, I mean anything. Thing. 
you guys ever remember Clay Hecox from the old Calvary Chapel? That dude used to play the piano. He could play like he could write the most amazing worship music. He could play the piano like Beethoven. I mean, it was the craziest thing. And then you found out on the side, he made custom furniture. It's like on the side, he makes custom furniture. Yeah, he doesn't really do that because he's on staff at the church. But if he wanted to, he could make his wife a whole shelving unit. You know what I mean? Glass front. Like, hate him. <laughs> And in all, um, in all honesty, are, is it done? Are we done? Everybody's got? In all honesty, and, and I mean this in humility, I really do. So many people ask, oh man, you got gifts, you, you do this, you do that, you can do jujitsu. Listen, it's because this is what I do. 25 years, and when I got saved, I got saved radically. I don't, I, I don't look back at a time and, and wonder, come on in, Rock, we, we have, come on. I don't look, that helps. <laughs> I don't look back at a time a couple of years and go, man, I was really serious about the things of the Lord. Then no, I'm more serious now than I've ever been about the things of the Lord. I started doing jujitsu when I was 40 years old. I never stopped. The least I ever did was three days a week, the least. I've been doing the same, I've been working the same job, guys, for 20, 30 years, right baby, 30 years? This is what I do. So if you ask yourself, why aren't my gifts being used to the fullest? Why aren't they being revealed to me? Well, let me ask you about your consistency and your steadfastness. Do you want spiritual gifts? Put yourself in a position, A, to have them exercised, B, to have them used, and have the faith enough to not be afraid. Start somewhere crazy. You go out to lunch after church, tell the waitress or the waiter, hey, can we pray for you while we pray for the food? What was your name again? God, we lift up Jim here and we pray that you'll bless him and you make a lot of money today and that he knows the power of your love. Amen. Thanks. And he goes back and tells his waiter friends, oh, that guy's a weirdo. And he cuts you all up and then everybody walks by your table, mocks you, makes fun of you. But when that guy Jim goes home, he's going to be like this. Because you had a gift of the word of wisdom or the word of knowledge or God poured something upon you because you stepped out there on the water. Okay, he's going to play a song real quick. This is the representation of the blood of Christ. This is the representation of the body. We will partake together, look at it, and contemplate the power of the shed blood forgiving your sins, all of them, and the power of his life in your life. Okay? Go ahead, brother.
On the night that our Lord was crucified, he gathered those closest to him. And after a ceremony, which we call sacrament, he told his friends, his closest followers, do this in remembrance of me as often as you do. Remembering. My morning devotion this morning, I'm in the book of Revelation, and I read a verse, and I just, I was so blown away by it, I just wanted to sit there, I wanted to teach this. In the first chapter of the book of Revelation, the seventh verse, it says, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. When he comes back, I'm on his team. And I want to be found doing his will and his way. So according to his word, his encouragement, I want his life in my life. And I want to do what he has me to do without fear of anything or anybody. So I take... But I also know that without the shed blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And without the new covenant, there's no power to accomplish that which I want to accomplish. So, as a reminder to God that I still need him every day to accomplish these things and never want to try to do ministry in my own strength, I take... And with faith to believe that whatever God does, I'll get through it. I'll get through it. You'll get through it. God's going to prove that everything that's happened in your life somehow is going to turn out good. Amen? Amen? Amen. Have a great rest of your week.